Hey everyone, this is Dr. Chrissy Waite, and I will be talking about some forensic toxicology. This is not all-inclusive of everything, however, this is going to hit the high points of tox and what we look for. So, some basic terminology to know, pharmacology is about drugs and their effects in the body. The drug itself is a chemical to have an effect upon the body, a poison is a type of drug that is life-threatening and a metabolite is when your body metabolizes the drug or substance that is put into the body and it is chemically changed. So the common body fluids that are tested in a medical examiner's lab and things that we extract from the body are mostly blood, urine, vitreous from the eyes. We can take pieces of liver and spleen in bodies that we cannot extract blood and urine. We can take those two organs. The spleen is preferable over liver in our lab because the spleen filters out the blood so it contains all that stuff that was in the blood. So that's a good place to go. Decomposition fluid is not the best, but if that's what you got, that's what we have to use. And the last resort that nobody likes are insects, mostly maggots. We can blend those up. This is gross, I know, but we can blend those up and get out what the maggots have been ingesting and what was in the body that the maggots have been eating. Hmm. So the types of drugs that we're going to touch upon are some stimulants like ecstasy, cocaine, methamphetamine. Narcotics are mostly all of the opioids, illicit and licit, prescription, everything like that. Inhalants are those that people inhale. Um, I did not include whiteout, permanent markers, those kinds of things. These are the ones that mostly get abused like the cans of dust off and poppers. You also have hallucinogens. Those are LSD, PCP, your cannabinoids, bath salts also fall under here as well as the stimulants. You can have maybe some mushrooms, stuff like that. Non-illicit drugs or the prescription drugs that are commonly abused can be your benzos which are anti-anxiety, antidepressants, um, some antidepressants can cause severe side effects taken with other stuff that we don't like. Over-the-counter drugs that are common, you know, the cough medicines, the Sudafed, those different things, they can speed up your heart rate and people can use those to try to get high as well. So different things that we look for when we are doing any kind of like overdose case or suspected drug case, if there's any kind of indication that this was a possible suicide, we look for a pill mass. So we want pills that have been ingested and a lot of pills that have then stuck together. They can't all be digested. They kind of form this like conglomeration of goop ball in the stomach and we can send that off to get tested or we can find a multiple amount of just individual pills that have been partially digested and stuff like that. So those are most common in suicides. Body packing is when someone is used as a drug mule or trafficking and balloons or different packages of drugs are then swallowed or inserted for travel. Stuffing is kind of similar. However, the person in this situation is going to swallow all the drugs that they have or anything that they have to avoid being arrested or caught with their substances. Also, you can find this scene in Super Troopers. Um, in both packing and stuffing, it's important to examine pretty much the entire bowel, the stomach, esophagus, everywhere, because you never know where these packages have made it to and where the rupture site may or may not be. So one of the biggest and most important things that we do at a medical examiner's office is we have our forensic investigators go out to the death scenes and take photographs of all important paraphernalia or important clues that 
drugs may be involved. So you can see in this picture there is a lighter attached to a belt, possibly used as a tourniquet, as well as a hypodermic needle. And then you have a piece of foil that has some burnt residue and also a spoon that has some residue. So a lot of these things would be collected by the investigator and brought back to a toxicology lab or collected by the police and tested for those residues to see what kind of drugs that they're dealing with. So intravenous drug use can lead to a multitude of different chronic conditions and complications. Mostly you're going to get your infections and a lot of skin infections and contamination by injecting through your skin that you're likely not cleaning off before you um, inject. So you're going to get your staff and your straps and stuff that are commonly found in your body, but you can also get a multitude of other things and really, really, really bad bugs that are resistant to antibiotics and medicines. So mostly you're going to find a lot of the hepatitis, some HIV, right-sided endocarditis of the tricuspid valve. That's where intravenous drug users usually get infections if it goes to the heart. Foreign body granulomas are mostly found in the lungs. Um, you can see these in snorting and inhaling of different foreign substances in the drugs, but they're going to be in different places in the lungs if they're inhaling these drugs versus injecting these drugs. So this is a slide and you can see on the top of the hand is a very large scar and raised lesion from injecting right into and underneath of the skin. So that's popping and then the linear scar is more of what we would call a track mark. Um, we usually find those in the antecubital fossas, but you can find those anywhere along the vasculature. You're going to feel them and they're going to feel very raised and ropey because that vessel underneath has essentially scarred over from being injected into so many times. So addressing the foreign material found in the lungs, these are all pictures of lungs. Letter A is a very low power view of the lungs and you can see the red areas. Those are the vessels and surrounding those areas are a lot of histiocytes and giant cells and stuff that have eaten and in, like engulfed and created these granulomas of foreign material. So B is a little bit higher power. You can see this like grayish pink cotton candy like substance that's within this granuloma and a nice big giant cell that's in the bottom right of this granuloma with multiple nuclei so about the like five o'clock position on that and then C just another different view a little bit higher power of these giant cells, there's some calcification in the bottom right corner, which is that dark blue, kind of crackly looking stuff. That's calcified granulomas, giant cells all around. And then you see again, this like amorphous grayish blobby material. D is when we polarize the lungs that has these foreign material in it. And you can see how this foreign material lights up like a Christmas tree. It becomes very white and bright. And that's how we can tell that there's foreign material. So different types of foreign material can be found. Talc is really amorphous, um, kind of the granulomatous stuff, which is what we were looking at in the previous slide. And then you can also see what buzzwords are Maltese crosses. If you see those on the polarized material, that's actually starch. So this talc and starch are used as cutting agents into a lot of drugs that are then inhaled or injected. So the difference you're going to find if it's inhaled or snorted is these four materials are going to be within the airways, going to be within the intraalveolar spaces, within the bronchi, so forth and so on. If it's injected, it's going to be in or around the vasculature. So we're going to dive in a little bit into more specific drugs. Cocaine. Cocaine you can smoke as crack, you can inject, you can eat it, you can snort it, you can 
all the different things that you've seen in all of the movies. And so the different routes of ingestion have different times of onset, where they're going to peak, and how long these are going to last. So you can see that the quickest onset is when you smoke crack. I'm not suggesting you do any of this, but that's how you're going to get your quickest onset and effects of cocaine. The metabolism of cocaine, it breaks down very, very quickly inside of the body into a specific metabolite of cocaine called benzyl echinine. We shorten it as BE because who wants to say benzyl echinine every day? So BE lasts a lot longer within the body and it can be detected in the urine where it's concentrated for up to a few days. BE cannot cross the placenta or the blood brain barrier. So if you take cocaine and then you die almost immediately after taking it and cocaine is found within the baby, that cocaine has crossed the blood brain barrier and the placenta. If BE is found within the baby, that means that the baby itself has metabolized the cocaine. The BE did not cross over into the baby. When cocaine is used with alcohol and specifically ethanol, so just your regular run-of-the-mill alcohol that you're going to get in a bar or anything like that, the cocaine and the ethanol form a highly cardiotoxic metabolite called cocaethylene. And not only is cocaine cardiotoxic, but adding that alcohol on top of it, you're literally asking for a heart attack. So the effects of cocaine upon the body is mostly cardiac related. You're gonna get your high blood pressure, your heart rate's going to increase, your temperature. Everything is just a recipe for an infarct or a stroke or seizure or something like that. I do have excited delirium down here. Um, if you've heard of excited delirium, it's mostly when somebody takes drugs and they're so blitzed out of their mind that usually nothing's going to stop their attack. I don't want to say attack, but it's n nothing's going to stop the drug effects upon the body. And usually there's a run in then with the police because they're acting psychotic and erratic and it turns into a big thing. There's some debate right now about whether excited delirium is going away, but that's a whole different topic. Postmortem findings when somebody takes cocaine, usually the heart's enlarged because it's been overworking and pumping extremely much more harder when somebody takes cocaine. You're going to see some fibrosis probably from previous MIs. You can actually get advanced atherosclerosis with increased risk of clotting within the heart coronary arteries and a perforated septum. You can see if everybody who uses it snorts it, but a lot of people don't do that anymore. Moving on to amphetamines. So amphetamines are actually part of prescription drugs used for ADHD. They can also treat depression and narcolepsy because they keep you awake. Um, amphetamines are also found in ecstasy and also meth. So what amphetamines do is really similar to cocaine, but they cause some more effects as well. So they can be used as anorexic agents where you don't want to eat, you want to lose weight. These are just going to cause you to be like really up and active and you're not even going to think about eating. It increases that energy. You're going to decrease your drowsiness and your tiredness, but it's also going to cause you to grind your teeth a lot and can cause you to start seeing things and have some seizures. So methamphetamine is made by a whole bunch of different chemicals. So when an investigator goes out to the scene and they see, oh, here's some batteries or some Sudafed and here's some methanol and lighter fluid and all these different things. That's kind of not a good thing and you want somebody to clear out that scene for you because these things are highly toxic and if they did it wrong can be explosive. Side effects of using methamphetamine. Um, you just, uh, you're just not looking too good anymore. Um, everybody has probably seen those police photos of before and after meth. Um, if not, you can al always Google the faces of meth and it's an enlightening experience. And the wonderful teeth and hygiene because you just don't care anymore. You're just 
happy and living your life on meth. Opiates, opium is from the poppy plant and poppy seeds. You're not going to be able to eat enough poppy seeds to cause a positive drug test. That's a whole different thing. Anyway, so your opium comes from the poppy plant and the morphine and codeine are automatically present. Those are just byproducts of processing the opium and the poppy plant into the morphine. So what morphine does in the opiates is it depresses your respiratory drive, it causes you pinpoint pupils, and it works to not let you in the bathroom. So that's always a fun side effect. With the depression of your respiratory drive comes pulmonary congestion and edema. So this edema is what we see as a foam cone, and this foamy material with tons of bubbles is all within the airway, your trachea, your bronchi. It comes out your nose and your mouth when you die because your lungs aren't working anymore. Your heart's not pumping, your lungs aren't moving, you're not pushing that air in and out. So this all just bubbles up and comes out when you die. Heroin in itself is called diacetylmorphine, so it breaks down to its very specific metabolite called 6-monoacetylmorphine. Some people use the mono, some people don't. 6-MAM, 6-AM, it doesn't matter. It's the same thing. People combine it with cocaine because they want the effects of the heroin and the morphine as well as the upper effects of the cocaine, so they call it a speedball. So one in they like combat each other in their effects and it gives you a better high. I don't know. Um, depending upon where you get the heroin, it has different names and different amounts of purity. Fentanyl. So fentanyl is mostly found in the hospitals as a medical opioid to combat pain. It's 50 to 100 times more potent than morphine depending upon the type of fentanyl or opiate that you get. Some analogs that have been made now, especially like carfentanil. Carfentanil is highly, highly lethal in the most smallest amount. Even a grain of salt of carfentanil can be lethal because it's 10,000 times more potent than morphine. So it actually is used as an elephant sedative, not for humans, because we are not the size of elephants. So when somebody takes carfentanil unknowingly because they think that they're getting fentanyl or heroin because nobody knows what you're getting anymore off the streets and you have Narcan, thank you Jesus, but this Narcan is not going to work. This Narcan is not going to touch the carfentanil effects. You might maybe come out of it for a few seconds, if that, and you're gonna slip right back under because the effect of carfentanil is so much stronger and it binds and there's so much more than what the Narcan can combat. So you need so many more tubes of Narcan to even try to touch the effects of carfentanil. So it's highly deadly. You don't wanna mess with it. Routine, wow, routine drug screens do not detect illicit fentanyls. They can't find the analogs, they can't find the carfentanils, the three methyl alpha fentanyls, all those different fentanyls. You can't see it in the hospitals. You have to have specific tests for it. And even us in a medical examiner's toxicology lab can't even find some of these things. Bath salts. The only thing that I really know about bath salts is the whole zombie thing that happened and people eating each other's faces, which is not good. So Bath salts, you never know what you're going to get in anything, so just don't do drugs. There's the PSA. They have the same effect as like methamphetamine. Some of them can be more like ecstasy. Who knows what you're going to get? You're going to more than likely have psychosis with paranoia. You can get rhabdo. It's going to break down your muscles. Just not good. Then you get your synthetic cannabinoids which sound good in theory because, oh, you're not getting the toxic things and it's not really pot, but, oh, it's fake, but no, no. Um, so they're making these things and they're selling them as like potpourri or whatever they want to call them. It's actually like a liquid that gets sprayed onto pieces of plant material. So then you can smoke the plant material and it binds stronger 
into the brain than THC does. So you're not getting that wonderful THC effects of the like calmness and stuff. You're getting the opposite. You're getting hallucinations and psychosis and hypertension and tachycardia and probably seizures. So again, stay away from drugs. Ethylene glycol is antifreeze. Um, methanol is contained within ethylene glycol. That's what it's made out of. It's used in your car. It's a chemical not to be drank or for human consumption. If somebody does drink it because it smells sweet and fruity and yay, let no. If you survive drinking ethylene glycol, likely you're going to end up with renal failure because it's highly nephrotoxic and you are going to get calcium oxalate crystals within your kidney tubules. And again, this is a picture that's polarized and you can see the little white speckles of these crystals fluorescing. So methanol, which we just discussed briefly, in itself is moonshine or wood alcohol. If you drink methanol in its purest form, your body is going to try to break it down the same way that it does regular ethanol, and it's going to break it down into formaldehyde, which we use in pathology laboratories to preserve bodies and organs. You don't want your insides being preserved. That then gets broken down to formic acid, and formic acid is highly toxic to your eyeballs and can make you go blind. Formic acid is what also can be found in some ants. Um, and by ants, I don't mean your female relative, I mean the insect. So methanol causes severe acidosis, vomiting, blindness again, respiratory depression, it's found in some hand sanitizers. There's the whole thing with the COVID about hand sanitizers now. Don't use the ones with methanol because you can absorb it into your skin. And this is why. Methanol is not really too good for human consumption. So to end everything, that was really brief over really specific things that we find most commonly here at the medical examiner's office for our talks. The samples that you want to get if you're looking for specific things. So I have a list here. Usually we want blood and we want blood from the femoral veins. We always go veins instead of arteries. The veins are more so representative of what's flowing through your body and what's already been distributed. So your femoral veins have the most important blood first. So if we can't get it from the femoral, then we'll work our way up and more centralized into the heart. If we can't get blood at all um, because of trauma or something like that, if there's blood pooled in body cavities, we'll get what we can take. Um, we'll take what we can get. So we want as far away from the heart because of the concentrations. The more concentrated you're going to find within the heart because it's more central and that's where things pool. Vitreous, we take the inside of the eyeball juice. You can see glucose levels of the body. You can see the 6 a.m. of heroin as well as alcohol levels. Urine, you have to be careful when you do anything with urine because you have to realize that your urine is concentrated because it's pooled in the bladder. So when we pull urine, it's not necessarily representative of what's in your body at that moment. It is what was used and what was in your body. So concentrations are not really looked at from the urine. You want concentrations from the blood. The liver, we can look at that, but you want to go to the right liver, not the left. The left overlies the stomach, and when you die, the stomach acids and stuff can leach into the liver, so you're getting a false picture if you take anything from the left liver. Gastric contents, I touched upon that with like the pills and stuff like that, so we can look for those. Kidney is good to look for heavy metals if somebody's suspecting like lead poisoning or something like that. Headspace vials are just little glass vials that you can put like lung and stuff in to look for different gases and all those inhalants and stuff like that. Head hair, stuff stays in your hair because it's growing out of you. So chronic drug use, metals, things like that. For infants, we can look at the meconium because it actually 
builds up until delivery, so it's actually storing everything that that fetus was exposed to while it was um, in utero. So meconium, as gross as it is, it's still a really good thing to look at. So overall, this was not all-encompassing of everything, every drug ever, but it's really hard to go fishing for something that you're not too sure what you're looking for. So if we have a targeted idea of what we're looking for, if somebody thinks that they were poisoned by moonwort or something like that, then we need to know that. We can't just say, oh, they were poisoned. Okay, poisoned with what? We can't go on fishing expeditions for everybody. We don't have the means, we don't have the money, nobody does. Everything in the world can essentially become toxic. Water is toxic at a certain level. Everything over the counter, whatever you ingest can become toxic at certain levels. So poisoned is very vague. So we need to have some kind of idea. Um, this resource is more about forensic toxicology, the testing, if you guys are interested in that. These are some of the resources that I've used. Hopefully that makes sense. Any questions, let me know. Thanks.